First of all, thanks organizers for inviting me. It's really great to be here. Um, I am PhD at Jagiellonian University, and I'm also co-advised uh, from Edinburgh University. And today I would like to talk about understanding how deep networks learn. It is about optimization, but actually we would like to look more into um, things that we do and why we are doing them. It is about uh, the last uh, year of my research or our research that I have done in collaboration with Edinburgh and uh, Montreal University. So we will look at optimization in this very specific um, angle. There are many angles and people talk about optimization in uh, many uh, different ways. We will first look into the fact that uh, neural networks can memorize data like a lookup table or like a database. Then we'll look at the often or almost always overlooked importance of uh, how wide is the minima that you find. So when you converge your network, you usually look at the loss value or we usually look at the loss value, but there is a lot of hidden information and value in uh, the width of minima. Then we'll look at everything through Bayesian, from Bayesian perspective, just because it's cool. Um, then we'll look at SGD from more mathematical perspective. So the, the, for, the fourth point will be the only one containing more math, um, which I included to like show connections to topics in physics, um, but it won't be necessary to follow the talk. And uh, then I will conclude uh, with um, what I am working on now. So first, uh, motivation. Why, why am I looking um, into understanding how deep networks work? Um, as Krzysztof said, there are, this is very important to pick a research topic carefully. So I think we are now at this uh, point where deep networks are more engineering effort and we do not understand them theoretically. So this is a flowchart that is dear to my heart. Um, I don't know how many of you know it, but it works like this. If you have a thing that you, um, that you want to fix and it does move and it shouldn't move, then you apply duct tape, right? If you have a thing that shouldn't move, um, sorry, if you have a thing uh, that should move and it doesn't, you apply W40. Very useful when you are fixing bikes. So I, I, would, I would like to say that there is some resemblance to what we are doing. Um, is your network overfitting? Yes, well, you should apply dropout. Um, is your network hard to optimize? Does it have high variance? Uh, does it uh, converge forever? Yes, well, you should apply batch normalization. This is what like every consulting person would say. But, um, but why is an interesting question. There is another angle um, uh, why this problem is important. So we want our networks to learn semantic good features. Like when it recognizes paddleboard, we want it to think about that it is a wooden paddleboard that is used to propel yourself uh, through the river. What happens usually when we train CNNs can be much different. Um, this is a topic of ongoing debate, what actually CNNs learn. But here is one take on it from paper from 2014. So every texture here, every image, is uh, found in the image space so that the CNN maximizes its confidence. So for instance, here, this black and green texture is a paddle. And we would say it's more like a texture. It doesn't represent any semantic value of a, pad of a paddle. Similarly, here we can see a brick-like uh, texture which is most confidently classified by network as a brick wall. Uh, sorry, it looks like a brick wall is uh, classified as a, co a computer keyboard. So there is an open question, uh, does network learn actually features that we would uh, find interesting? So the scope of this lecture, I'm talking about deep networks. So you can see here a deep network. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's like inception. And I'm talking about gradient descent. So stochastic gradient descent. So let me just say in a few words um, what is stochastic gradient descent. We can, we can see here iso lines of a loss function. So you can think about loss value stretching towards you. Um, and the black curve, I hope it's visible, it's gradient descent. So it's taking the whole batch to compute gradient direction. This gradient direction is fantastic. It always goes orthogonally to iso lines and goes to the minimum. Stochastic gradient descent, on the other hand, is doing sort of a random walk. It sometimes can go in the opposite direction to gradient. As you can see here, it went actually backwards. And the talk will be about importance of this going backwards, which is pretty, pretty weird, though everyone knows that stochastic gradient descent is an important regularization. So references, or what I'm talking about, 
Um, I will focus on our three papers. They were, uh, all of them were written in collaboration with uh, Joshua Benjo, with whom I have interned, and the last one with my advisor from Edinburgh. And they're really just following footsteps of other great papers. So these two are from iClear. Last iClear has seen pretty good papers. And there is this one from Ancient Nips 94 by Schmidhuber and Hoschreiter. And it is true that Schmidhuber has, for, uh, in some sense, foreseen a lot of things that we'll be talking today about. So first of all, uh, memorization. Memorization, I would say, has been discovered last iClear by Zhang. Um, we are giving network images like we usually do, think CIFARPEN, your favorite image data set. But we, for each image, randomize label. So this is a dog, but we assign it second class, which is cat. This is a cat, we assign it a bus. And we train on this, on this uh, data set. Here we have, on X axis we have time, on Y axis we have loss. What happens is that if you have true labels, which is the blue curve, the network optimizes happily, very quickly, Everything is fine. But if we give it random labels, it also dutifully optimizes and finds also a solution. And I will come back to this point over and over. Both solutions are at zero loss or 100% accuracy. Why is it important? Well, there is a very natural question. If this happens, could it be that our networks just memorize? Are our networks any smarter than like one nearest neighbor or lookup table? So I think this paper really sent waves through the community. Um, here's our, our take on this paper. We focused on a few um, specific uh, subsequent points, so we followed the logic, but we tried more things. Here is the first finding, which tackles this question if networks really memorize or they do something else. Um, so here, we have few curves. The solid one is the training accuracy, uh, the dashed one is validation accuracy, and now we won't like, randomize all the points. We'll have some examples having true labels, like this dog, sorry, this flower is a flower, and like, I have twice flower, but this is just that 20% like, of data has true labels. And then for the, for the remainder of, of data, we'll again randomize them. So the finding is that when we train deep networks, using SGD at least, there is this very weird phenomena that SGD focuses only on the true labels in the beginning of learning. So look at Epoch 5. At Epoch 5, we have maximum validation accuracy and pretty low memorization. These are different levels of random corruption. So SGT magically focuses only on the true labels or mostly on true labels in the beginning and for the remainder of training, which is like 95 epochs, it memorizes. It can be generalized. So we, oh, it turns out that SGT generally uh, prefers first simple examples and then complex examples. It resembles to some extent how we learn. We first learn simple stuff and then difficult stuff. So what is the experiment we run? Um, it was fairly simple. So we took a uh, MNIST data set, which is the famous data set of digits. We ran one epoch, but we repeated this experiment 1,000 times or 100 times. And we looked at which epoch given example is, if in the, after this first epoch of training, given example from train set is classified correctly. So if an example is easy, then probably after every, every time we repeat this experiment, it will be classified correctly uh, always. So there are some points that in all 100 experiments were correctly classified after one epoch of training. These are easy. So on x axis we have ID of example and on y axis we have probability of being correct after one epoch. But there are some really difficult examples. And SGD like very, very consequently or always uh, will uh, ignore them in the beginning. Or not really ignore, but never will classify them correctly. This curve has this shape. This is like sigmoidal shape. I have no idea why it looks like this. But the point is that there are easy examples and hard examples that are very consistent. Uh, when we randomize either labels or uh, input, there is really no pattern. Um, this, this line is uh, horizontal. <coughs> so takeaway from this first short section is that deep networks can memorize, like a lookup table, and when we memorize, we have same loss value. So there is this very natural question why SGD picks actually network or solution that generalizes. Um, and we observed that deep networks, when trained using SGD, 
Memorize it at the end. So if you were to give your network examples that are random, but also examples that have true labels, SGD will mostly uh, ignore the random labels in the beginning. And deep network learns from simple to complex examples. So um, these, are, these are the takeaways. And let us focus on one of them, which is this one, that we have same loss value. We usually look at loss value, so we train network and we plot like a cross entropy. Um, but is that everything that we can, look, we can get from loss surface and where we ended up using SGD? Um, this is one of two important plots in this presentation. I mean, other plots are also cool, but like, this is important plot. So here we have on x-axis, this is from Keskar from ITU 2017. We have on x-axis, um, like your one parameter, we pretend here that loss surface is one dimensional, and on y-axis we have again loss. The loss is denoted here by f of x. Black curve represents training loss, and we have found two minimas, and there is like a puzzle, which, one, which minima is the one corresponding to memorization, or the one corresponding to network, that memorize points and is not generalizing at all to your validation. So these minima are on the same level, so they are both corresponding to 100% accuracy, but they differ. They differ in sharpness, and I will come back to this point over and over. So one, min one minima is sort of flat, and one is very sharp. And why does it matter? It matters for a very simple reason. When we have our test set, and this test set has some difference from train set, and this always happens. Even when we have perfect IID examples, just because we have finite training set and finite uh, test set, we will have discrepancy. So then it means that loss on test set will be shifted. It won't resemble exactly the black line. So if this is shifted to the right, we can see that actual minimizers of test loss are different than minimizers of the train loss. So let's track and let's shoot, uh, in our minds, vertical lines. So let's see here. So we found this minima. So it's actually loss on red curves, which is test set, is similar. So all is good in this minima. But let's, let's draw a vertical line from this point. So it goes up, up, and lands somewhere here. So you can see that th this minima, even though it has same loss value, it actually doesn't generalize. This is a very simple geometric concept. It has been first observed by Schmidhuber, and Keskar paper is actually not only about this, but about how SGD prefers one over another. And, well, the puzzle, or the solution to the puzzle, is that this will be the point that memorizes, or the solution that memorizes, because it doesn't generalize at all. This uh, width, or robustness, to this uh, shift distribution is a very well-known thing in classical machine learning. Like, whole theory of SVMs revolves around this concept. When we have two clouds of points, how do we separate them? We can separate them using this line or this one. And which one is better? Well, this one can be seen as better because it's more robust. <coughs> if you were to sample an, a new point, this one will have more robust classification than this one and will have less likely shift a switch of label in this because this margin is larger. So all of this has been just uh, waving hands. Let's focus on actual results. This is from Keskar. Keskar paper is about SGD, so stochastic gradient descent, and he says that when we train with large bar size versus small bar size, what actually changes is what type of minima you prefer. Do you prefer the sharp one or the wide one? So here we have training accuracy. Small bar size, which is like, I don't know, that was like probably 50, like 1,000, and you can see that in both cases he was able to get like 100% accuracy. But when you use large bar size, it turns out that it generalizes always much worse. So large bar size uh, generalizes worse. This was known before Keskar, at least as a common folk knowledge. Um, what he went uh, and done after that is he plotted the same curves as were suggested by Schmidt Huber years ago. So, um, we think about, we take two minimas, so one is, th these are two minimas. Uh, this plot is pretty weird, uh, I have to really go through the story how it was created. So we take two minimas, um, which are solutions of, as, like, which are the minimas found by SGD, either with large bar size or small bar size. We draw a straight line, like geodesic between them. 
and then we plot loss value at each point of this interpolation. So you can see that we go from large bar size minima, we go through some energy barrier, so this is a train, a train loss, and we land up in shear minima. So this is how actually this loss surface looks, but in one dimensional slice. What is pretty remarkable is that large bar size solution, is act, sorry, small bar size solution, so this flat minima, this minima is actually uh, wider than this one. So geometrically, SGT really peaks wider minima. Seems to be true. And we can again see that there, are, there is some shift of this uh, test curve between uh, this and this. Here we have red, which is accuracy, and you can see that accuracy follows the same trend as uh, loss. So accuracy is also 100% in both cases, but generalization is much worse. I think it's a beautiful geometric picture, which really um, reveals some of the mysteries what happens with SGD. So uh, takeaway, deep networks have multiple solutions at same loss values, like one of them can memorize, another can generalize well. SGD with small batch size favors the wide one. We don't understand yet why. Kaskar paper was just empirical. And this, uh, how wide is the minima really matters for generalization. So now we know empirical results, let's do some theory. Uh, but theory will be very mild here. So we'll talk a bit about Bayesian inference or an, in general Bayesian view on learning. So what is Bayesian inference? So here we have an agent that has coins and he is suspicious that one of the coins is actually a forged one. So he's calling police. Um, so how does Bayesian inference look in this case? We start with some hypothesis. Here we have two hypotheses. Either the coin is forged or it's an actual legit coin that has 50-50% landing on either side. We have our prior belief. So if we believe government, then we believe that this coin is probably right. So next, we measure likelihood for each two before, we measure likelihood of, uh, or we have some <coughs> observations and we think about how these observations are likely given hypothesis. So we flip the coin 20 times. And then, well, this agent or this uh, character has observed that 20 times the coin has landed tails, so it's probably forced. So we pick hypothesis that has larger likelihood, so how predictive is the hypothesis of this distribution or this data set, plus prior belief. Mathematically, this is just that posterior is proportional to, uh, so this is probability of hypothesis given data set is proportional to multiplication of likelihood and prior or we can add the two if we take logarithm. So how does it, re how does it even remotely relate to deep networks? So now, uh, our hypothesis are different sets of parameters. This is what changed here. Now we have some, again, we have some prior belief about which one are better and which one are worse. This prior belief often can be regularization like L2. So we just say that uh, solutions that are unlikely are these ones that are of large magnitude. So far, so good. Then we train and we measure loss for each set of parameters. The trick in deep networks is that often this loss will be same. So we really need to have a good prior. And we, we pick parameters that minimize sum of loss and regularization term. Mathematically, we have loss. Um, we have like some loss. Uh, our loss is a composition of two terms. Regularization, so like your favorite L2, and uh, mean squared error. It could be some, something else. How it works in practice, uh, I think it's informative to, to look uh, through a sequential process. So in sequential process, we have our prior, and then given next uh, points, we'll update it. We are fitting line. So line is specified by two floats, or like two values. So we have a prior that is two-dimensional. And in the beginning, we have no data, so we believe that all lines are sort of uh, not very vertical, neither no, nor very uh, horizontal because our prior in the corners is pretty low, so we just fit these nice looking curves. Then as we get first point, we get uh, likelihood, so this is uh, how likely is the data given uh, different parameters, and then we multiply the two plots. We, we just, you just can think about overlaying them and like multiplying them, and we get, as we get more points, picker and picker posterior. And you can see that uh, we pick this line that fits points. So, Let's talk for, for a bit about 
what what is a good uh, what is a good uh, prior distribution for weights in network? What sh what many have suggested is that Occam Razor is a good way of thinking about this. So when we have two competing theories, this is just a statement of Occam Razor. Um, when we have two competing theories that make exactly the same prediction, the simpler one is better. So an illustration of this is like, were these shapes created by either a very bored person or by al aliens, right? And we obviously, based on this uh, inference strategy, would say, well, that was probably a human because it's much more likely or simpler explanation. Uh, how does it relate now? So now we can connect the dots. So a few of the previous slides were not really connected to memorization, they were not really correct, uh, um, connected to loss or width of minima. So now what I would like to propose, or like I'm just um, referring to old papers, is that width of minima is a good uh, way of picking simpler solutions. So it is a prior in this Bayesian inference, from this Bayesian inference perspective. So to, re uh, uh, so we did talk about weight decay being first approximation of simplicity, but width of minima it seems to be better. Let me argue why. Here we have two minimas, and just think about saving your network to disk. So you need to have an encoding procedure and you will save your um, network to disk, so you will have a text file where you will just write every, uh, every weight value. H what precision do we need to uh, encode this minima versus this one? Well, it seems like we need like float 128 here, right? Because we really need to be very precise about this point. Because if we miss it a bit, our loss value will go dramatically uh, up. Here though, we can be pretty sloppy. We can encode maybe in flo float 60. Because, well, if, even if we miss here by one unit of length, it should be fine. Uh, there are better approaches than width, probably, but this is open research question. I would propose, for instance, that maybe some actual encoder where we would cluster weights and then save them would be a better predictor of simplicity or a better prior, but width seems to be a good approximation. Uh, so uh, takeaway from this one is, again, I will hammer this point that deep networks have multiple solutions and we need a prior to distinguish between them. And uh, width of minima, seems to be a prior that promotes simplicity, just like Occam Razor. So now there is this um, natural question that uh, we train networks and it seems that they pick, they pick, SGD picks a solution that is simple or white. And uh, we would like to understand why. Maybe to train networks better, maybe to construct new optimizers, maybe to inform better regularizations. It seems to be an important question. So in the last part, I will talk about mathematics uh, or at least some hypothesis about why and how SGD steers towards flat minima. There will be some math inside, but uh, it will be well contained. And also I'll try to go through every equation. So let's dive in. Uh, first, some intuition. So here we have uh, on x-axis of this beautiful picture, we have a first parameter. On y-axis, we have second parameter. You can think about an axis outstretching towards you as loss value. And here we have specific uh, parameter in time. So this is where we are in our SGD uh, training. And we sample gradients. Each arrow is a different sample with large bar size. So all of the gradients will be very well correlated. They will all descend our loss surface and they will be all sort of perpendicular to isolines. But what happens when you have large, small bar size? Well, some parameters, some updates can go in opposite direction, some can go in parallel direction to isoline, and all of this can happen. So for instance, we could go, we could go from here to here, which wouldn't probably happen in large bar size case, a large uh, bar size case. We can now relate the story, the simple picture to our uh, figure from the beginning of the talk. So now we have again sharp and, and uh, flat minimizers. And now the difference is that we think about many particles at the same time. I will use word particles to confuse you more, but um, 
the word particle means just the weight vector. So you can think about running SGD multiple times and tracking evolution of all of them at the same time. So here we have, uh, we are at some point in time and we have all of them here. And we have low noise. And let's think about how uh, this will uh, evolve in time. So this is time zero. And gradients are very well correlated. They are, they are going downwards. So as long as the information from lost surface is strong, they will go towards the minima here. Now, at the bottom, there is no longer information from gradients. The all gradients are zero, let's say. So now noise really kicks in for the first time. Uh, they will jump a bit, but then they will be driven again downwards because the loss information is so strong. So it forms uh, a trap for, for these particles. And we really want to get here. That's what I'm trying to say. Because we have our belief, our prior belief, that this is a simpler solution. And there is nothing to, and it really doesn't compromise accuracy. So we should get there. But we cannot, it is a trap. So how can we solve this problem? In terms of that SGD, well, maybe by accident, maybe not. But SGD has a mechanism to do that if we have high noise. So again, the same situation. We have six particles that evolve in time. And already after first step, one will go backwards. This is a very stubborn one. One will be already here, so it has overshoot the minimum. The thing to understand here is that look that all of these arrows are horizontal because that's the axis of parameter. And also, when you have high noise, you don't really care about how deep you are because all the information of uh, the strongest signal is uh, actually noise, which is independent of depth. So you will just go here and just overshoot this, no problem. As time evolves, some will get stuck here. And we again have the situation that, as previously, that one is very close to the minima. When there was low noise, it will get uh, driven to the bottom. But here it can overshoot, and we can see that it went up here. And then already we have two uh, particles here, and it continues. Now the last thing to understand intuitively is like why will they stay here and they won't stay here? Well, we, it's just enough to measure uh, how wide it is. Because it is, let's say it is purely random. No information from loss, just for simplicity. Then you need like consecutive few steps in the same direction to get out of the minima. So imagine flipping coin five times. Like what is probability of getting five tails uh, in a row? Similarly, uh, this wide minima is a good uh, trap for uh, uh, these particles. And maybe as a coincidence, it's also, it also probably will generalize well. So we want SGD to go here. OK, so now we have intuitive understanding. So let's uh, dive into the, uh, the work. It's called uh, Three Factors Influencing Minima in SGD because we talk about three factors. We talk about learning rate, batch size, and variance of loss gradients that affect your, your preference for width versus depth of minima. It is a submission uh, right now in review uh, in collaboration with uh, Montreal and University of Edinburgh. So let's go into our three slides of theory. So first we think about uh, something gradient and we want to understand what is the noise structure. So G of S of given parameter is, has this term G of parameter, which is the true gradient. And then we assume from uh, large limit theorem, central large limit theorem, well, well, we assume it is Gauss because we can when we have a lot of samples. Um, so we have a zero mean <coughs> and we have a given structure of noise. Note the term S here. S is bar size. So when we go to infinity with bar size, we cancel this term, no more, and we get that batch gradient is same as gr true gradient. But we will have this noise and it will be important. Um, we'll decompose this into two matrices. That's actually not important. Um, this is SGD update. Nothing fancy here. This is parameter. So parameter in next time frame is previous parameter minus learning rate. So we denote learning rate here by eta times the gradient that you have. We approximate that by stochastic differential equation. So these are things from physics or like math. So we think about now smallest instance of time and we take derivative of parameter with respect to time. 
Um, this has certain assumptions, specifically that learning grade is small enough so we can do that because in large learning grade, uh, this, this uh, approximation simply doesn't hold. And we will go back to this point. So again, I will go back to this point again and again that first term is usually very intuitive because first term is simply learning grade time gradient. So there is nothing interesting up to this point. But now here we have some noise term, which is more uh, complicated. Important thing is that it is controlled by learning grade and batch size. So the amount of noise is controlled by both factors, nothing interesting. Uh, here we have uh, covariance of gradients, and here we have uh, technical um, no, uh, we have uh, technicality that we, sam we pretend that each at each time noise is independently sampled. So it resembles a Wiener process. This is a technical term, and we'll pro we won't see that too much. Uh, we won't see that in other slides, so we can forget about this. Um, this F, I, I'm not sure, like, I, I, I'm not sure if this is scalar or vector. I think it is scalar, but I'm not sure. It is not important. Uh, then it is important in derivations, but we go into Fokker-Planck equation where we won't have that anymore. Uh, and let us talk about Fokker-Planck equation. It is very standard for, so if there is anyone with physics background, just don't listen to me explaining it uh, because probably it will be confusing. But for the rest of us, this is Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, we go from, so here we have, uh, we have looked at single particle. Like imagine you had a camera and we looked at evolution of single particle. There was a path on last surface. Now we look at all of them. So we look at this quantity, which is a density uh, of, uh, density of finding given or probability of finding given parameter at given point. This is a very uh, physical thing. So we can think about physics here. Um, imagine, um, imagine a room that has been heated in a corner. So it has a given density or given temperature at each point. And this temperature obviously will evolve over time. And what we are interested in is running the simulation of temperature going to all, all corners of the room towards the infinity or running the simulation of parameters spreading across the whole surface. So we're looking at equilibrium distribution of this process. But to get there, we have to first solve this uh, differential, stochastic differential equation, stochastic uh, differential process. So let me first focus on J. J is flux. It is a vector assigned at each point in space. Again, think about room, but we really will be talking about lost surface. But if we attach this point in, uh, attach this vector at every point in room that uh, has a given temperature, this will point us towards uh, where the from where the, how the temperature is evolving. So for instance, if we, have a hot, if we have a hot corner, and we think about what is J at this hot corner, it will be probably positive because temperature will move from this hot corner to the rest of the room. It is very easy to understand again, like previously, the first term is super simple. So we have given probability of finding, so I will switch between temperature and probability of finding parameter, I hope, uh, this will become uh, intuitive, it is intuitive. So when we have given probability of finding parameter at given minima, let's say, then the J or flux is simply where is the true gradient uh, coming. So if we, I can come back to this point. So, well, if we are here, so here density, so if we were tracking density over this lost surface, all of the density will be here. And the J would be pointing downwards if there was no noise. So this is, uh, this is very intuitive. Jay is just saying how will this lost surface density evolve in, uh, in time. The interesting part is here. And while I don't want to go into this part, suffice it to say it is controlled by learning rate over batch size. Now what we are really interested in is tracking evolution of this one because this was just J. So it was just tracking how, where, is go where stuff is going or where like temperature is going. But we really want to think about what will be the temperature at the end. So we want this P, or what will be probability of finding parameters at given point at the end of training. So uh, last thing that I need to explain from this slide is this part. So we have the flux and we take divergence of it. Divergence of vector field is a very simple concept. Uh, 
It's just measuring how much stuff is flowing out. So we imagine a box. Let's put this box at a given, like either at the edge of lost surface or at the corner of hot room. And we are just thinking about how much stuff is escaping versus how much stuff is coming into it. So we measure this across all axes independently and we add the flag. So for instance, if from this box everything is going there, it will have a very large uh, positive divergence. So uh, as I said, we are interested in a time limit. So we are interested in the equilibrium distribution because if you were to run SGD forever, so if you were to run SGD for, I don't know, 100,000 epochs and restart it many times, the interesting question is how likely are we find to are likely, how are we likely to find a parameter at this minima? So we're really pinpointing given minima, like this one, and we want to understand what is probability of finding our solution here. If we have this uh, equation, it will allow us to really tell between SGD preferring wide minima versus sharp ones. Uh, this, uh, this is solution to Fokker-Planck. Again, this is very simple for uh, people with physics background. Uh, it wasn't very simple for me, but anyways, uh, if, we, if we assume a few things which are important, uh, we can give actually the end of time distribution. What is important is that probability of being somewhere is inversely proportional to loss, very intuitive. If our loss is very low, we are more likely to get there if we, we are training SGD because SGD is minimizing loss. The interesting part is that we have noise term and this noise is uh, again, this probability is multiplied here. It has very intuitive um, effect. So if this is lost surface, this noise is flattening the distribution. And just like we have seen in this animation, if you have high noise, you will flatten your, your, uh, you will flatten your distribution of loss or you will, your SGD procedure won't look at loss value. It will look at only at how white or sharp is given minimizer. But uh, we cannot yet uh, say anything about ending in given minima because this is density, so we need to integrate it out to get actually probability of finding yourself in a minima. So we take point and we integrate this previous equation, so we take the integral of it over quadratic approximation, and this is the same equation, but it has this term here. So now it means that if you were to run your SGD forever, have the assumptions that we have and restart it infinite amount of times, so uh, important assumptions, then this is exactly how uh, your probability of finding yourself in given minima would look like. Again, the lower loss, the better, the more likely to, this minima is for you, but now the width is also important. Here we have actually determinant of Hessian if you have a very sharp parabola, this is like from analysis, if you have a very sharp parabola, it will have a very large determinant. So you can see it here, high Hessian. If you have a wider parabola, it will have a lower determinant. So this picture is created in this way, or at least uh, that's what we want to show here, is that these two minimas have the same preference. You will end up more, uh, you will have same probability of ending here and here, because uh, this minima on the left is um, deeper, but is also sharper. So the two balance out each other. But if we increase noise, which is seen on the uh, right plot, then the loss value doesn't matter anymore. And because of that, the right minima becomes more important because uh, the difference in loss is small, but the preference over width remains the same. We can see that in equation very easily, but I wanted to show it first on the, on the picture. If you look at the equation, noise simply multiplies loss, but doesn't have any direct interaction with, uh, with the how wide is the minima. So, end of theory, but this, we, we all need to understand this one to understand experiments. So we are saying that there are three factors controlling trade-off between how deep and how wide is the minima that you will end in. These are unsurprisingly learning rate and batch size and variance of gradients. But the interesting part is that from this analysis, and I haven't said that yet, um, SGD seems to have only, seems to have less hyperparameters in the following sense. SGD has learning rate and batch size, we all know that. But in these equations, we see only learning rate to batch size. So it seems like it doesn't matter 
what specific values of learning grade and batch size are in SGT, what perhaps matter more is what is the ratio between the two. We'll see this in experiments, that we have this approximate invariance of SGD with respect to scaling up in the same linear fashion learning rate and batch size. This fact has been observed often empirically, for instance, in distributed training of deep networks. So let's go through experiments. These experiments are very simple. So we take stuff that is like um, tutorials, uh, tutorials uh, level of difficulty, uh, networks, um, very common data sets. So we use um, VGG11 and uh, CIFAR10 in this plot. And we do something very similar to Keskar. So we plot um, solutions of two minimas, loss uh, um, along the interpolation line between two minimas. But now we are, we are also training with larger bar size. To, to remind you, when Keskar trained with large bar size, he found a very sharp minimizer. But we adapt learning rate. So this minima has been found with beta equals one, so we can substitute it here. So it was learning rate 0 0.1 and bar size 50. Here on the, uh, here we have uh, beta four, so this is learning rate 0 0.4 and bar size 200. And we see that minima are found, found minima are very similar. And we observed that over and over that in general, generalization performance and training accuracy seem to be dependent on this ratio more than individual values. Here we have repeated the same experiment, but we took beta to one fourth instead of one. So this is like zero, zero, two or something, and this is like, I don't know, this over four, so like 10. This experiment uh, has been surprising to us because our theory talks only about where you will end up, but here we see that um, this uh, learning rate to batch size equivalence holds also for dynamics. So we here plot, first this one is simpler. So we just plot two learning curves, but for the same ratio of learning rate to bar size. And we see very good overlap between the two. So this is the right plot. The left plot is more interesting. So there is this learning rate schedule that people use more and more. Maybe we'll use it even more, which is learning, uh, cyclic learning rate. In cyclic learning rate, you increase and decrease learning rate over time. So it goes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5, then again to 0 0.1, and it cycles. This is plotted here, but well, this is accuracy. So you can see it oscillates, which makes sense given that we oscillate learning rate. What we did is we replaced learning rate oscillation with bar size oscillation. So now we train network for like one epoch with bar size 100, one epoch with bar size 500, and again we see that it has exactly the same effect. Of course, the curves do not overlap like exactly, but all important properties are preserved. And then we can, next we can cycle back to memorization that I talked in the beginning. So I have uh, said or hypothesized that solution uh, that memorizes will be probably sharper. This plot works as follows. We took a simple MLP, two layer, each has like 250 hidden units, like a sizable but small network, and we memorize data. So we run it on MNIST, but random labels. When we added 25% of labels, we added 25% of labels, and we rerun the experiment with different noise ratios. As I said in the beginning, we also report this in this paper, that in the beginning, you don't have, so I should first explain the, the, the graph. So on x-axis you have random label accuracy, on y-axis you have validation accuracy, and each dot represents an epoch. So there is a lot of dots, it is a scatter plot. Uh, as before, so I said in the beginning that network learns simple patterns first, or uh, ignores random labels, we also observe that here. Just track to the, the like 10% random label accuracy, which is like random prediction of random labels, and it corresponds to maximum validation accuracy. So epochs where you have maximum validation accuracy are also epochs where you d just ignore random labels. Now the color of the dot is the noise ratio used. The red color is like more noise in gradient. And the question we ask is, if we memorize data, data, how much validation accuracy does it cost us? So we memorize data and we throw out a bit of what we have learned before. 
it turns out that when you have a larger noise ratio, the memorization is cheaper in the sense that it preserves more generalization. We observed that in when we added 25% random labels and 50% random labels. Mm, last, uh, last, last experiment, because every theory has limitations, our theory has a lot of limitations. So for instance, well, there is learning rate that has to be small. It doesn't have to be ridiculously small. Like it, it still is like 0 0.1, 1.0. But if we go to like 1.5, 2.0, the theory breaks. So if our theory was perfect, these all lines would align, would be the same. But as we go to large learning rates, so like beta 15 corresponds here to 1.5, so it's like sizable. Uh, it, it, it is the first learning rate that breaks our theory in tra when training set is 45,000. Uh, when training set is smaller, it breaks even faster. So there are limitations, and the first one is that we need to approximate SGD by stochastic differential equation. So takeaways uh, from this last part of the main part. Um, so SGD probably is an implicit regularizer. People have known this in the community for a long time, but I wouldn't say people have really understood why this happens. We have hyperparameter in SVM C, which I mean, it can be any letter, right? But like a hyperparameter that uh, controls regularization. Uh, in the same way, learning rate over bar size in SGD controls uh, regularization. I haven't shown this plot, but you cannot go to infinite noise level. Because if we go to a very large noise level, SGD just doesn't see um, uh, loss value. And because we still want to optimize uh, the loss surface, we cannot go to in, like, very large noise, uh, noise values. In other words, you want wide minimizers, but you still want to have this 100% accuracy. SGD endpoint, this is predicted by theory and experiments, and this dynamics, so overlap of learning curves, um, depend on learning rate to bar size ratio, and we have this invariance when we scale linearly. So, uh, last few slides on what I am working on or what I think is worth working on. I guess it is the same thing. So, uh, <laughs> so um, we had one assumption that I glossed over, which was that we assume uh, uh, isotropy of noise. Or to say it differently, we assume all networks or layers in your network um, converge at the same rate or have same quality of gradients. This is so much not true. Let's, let's uh, think about what happens when you have different level of noise and gradients in different layers. Maybe I should first say why we have different levels of noise in different layers. For instance, it comes from the fact that one layers are very from, far from output, so they get worse gradients. Think about, like, um, there is this game when one person says something to other person and then it repeats and it goes in circle. There is some similarity of that in training. So there is back propagation going from the last layer, the last layer says something to the penultimate layer, and it, like, and it goes. So very, at least it will be that layers closer to input will have worse gradients or higher noise. There is another way. Uh, also, architecture means a lot. So when you have a uh, convolutional layer and you have fully connected layer, they also have very different quality of gradients. Convolutional layer will have much more signal because it averages inputs from back propagation over whole image because it's shared uh, weights, because it's sharing weights. So I hope I have convinced you that this happens. Now, why could it be bad? Um, it means that some directions, for instance, there are many implications, but it means that some directions optimize faster than others, or some layers optimize faster than others. And there is some competition between layers. If there is a convolutional layer in network and fully connected layer in network, Conversional net layer will probably converge faster than fully connected. And this is not always good. <coughs> I hypothesize here, so the slides in future work are not necessarily true. I think they are true, but um, I'm not sure. But many things, uh, many in, uh, existing regularizations like natural gradient, dropout, seem to be um, uh, helping with this problem. For instance, when there is batch normalization, um, all hidden representations are similar and one can derive some bounds on how variance of gradients will look if you have that. There is one specific uh, example of that that I wanted to talk about. In multimodal learning, 
we have different modalities, like sound and image. And if there are different networks reading each modality, this is, uh, we run experiment with MNIST, because this is such a great data set, but we split um, digit into four same size patches, and we have neural network reading each patch. And then, so this neural network reading each patch are here, first, second, third, and fourth, they merge at the end. So what happens in practice, and this is a simple experiment to run, is that if we add noise to one of them, which, uh, which is a very realistic scenario, modalities in real life, like image and sound, have very different quality of signal. Some have a lot of signal, some have very sparse signal. So we simulated that by adding a Gaussian noise to one of these. It turns out that if we train network end-to-end -end in, in this scenario, it overfits more when we add this noise in overall. And more importantly, it's actually better often to remove the modality with noise if you want to achieve good generalization. It is a known problem in multimodal learning to some extent. Um, people uh, use different weird regularizations. For instance, we do not like pre-training anymore in general in deep learning, but in multimodal learning, pre-training is still used in practice. Also, there's, there are used specific uh, types of uh, dropout, which exclude specific modalities on forward paths. They all seem to be linked to the fact that network just doesn't like, or maybe I should be more specific, SGD doesn't like gradients that have various variants. So the last slide, um, representation learning a connection. Because I said that one of my motivations is that we want to learn uh, features that are like semantic good. So I should first just spend a little while talking what are the good features. Seems like there are many definitions, but one of them is disentanglement, or one property of good representation is disentanglement. So disentanglement means that you represent your input in groups of features that are maximally independent between each other. For instance, you, uh, we would like to represent our cat as a set of neurons talking about this identity. There is a mammal with four legs. Uh, one set of uh, neurons that talk about this color, that it is uh, like a brown cat, and then about the posture, that it is like oriented in this way. We have very little guarantees in deep learning on whether we find such features and, or not. Uh, there is one algorithm that provably finds these features under very strong assumptions, which is, a, I would call it a version of PCA, but probably people would be offended. But it, is, uh, it has a closed form solution, it is few matrix multiplications, and it can find this neurons, uh, this set of features when this input is simple. Now, if, you, if we run autoencoder, I will, I will present here a few ideas that I don't, a few concepts that I don't define fully. Um, but if we use autoencoder, so we take input image of cat, we encode it into a hidden representation and decode it. If we don't employ any uh, architectural regularization, it won't learn anything interesting, let alone what ICA does. But Schmidt Huber in uh, this old NIPS paper that I mentioned, uh, says that if we find a wide minimizer of such an autoencoder, it will, under some, uh, under some assumptions, recover solutions of ICA. So I just wanted to drop here open question, which I don't know if answer is positive to, that perhaps we can solve many representation learning problems, but by actually caring about optimization rather than thinking about data sets and architectures. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention, and let me know if there are any questions.